everyone. Hi, um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Asia Aleem, and I am, um, oops, I'm one of the um, 12 of the first Tulane Posse here at Tulane. And um, with, <laughs> with Tulane Posse 2, there are 23 of us on campus. And without Deborah Beale and her vision of the Posse Foundation, we would not be students at Tulane or have had the experiences of getting to know each other as well as we do in Posse. And for that, we are very thankful of, uh, for this phenomenal woman here this evening. Welcome to Tulane University's New Day Social Entrepreneurship Speaker Series. This is the second year we are hosting the series in hopes of inspiring you to better understand and create new models for social change. The series showcases prominent and engaged leaders in social innovation and entrepreneurship to share their experiences, philosophies, insights, and advice to encourage our community to keep developing new solutions to solving our most, our most inextractable social challenges. With that in mind, it is my pleasure to get to introduce Deborah Beal. Ms. Deborah Beal is an education strategist who addresses the challenges of college access for underrepresented populations by identifying and fostering latent talent and opening opportunities for them to pursue higher education. Through her Posse Foundation, Deborah Beal offers an innovative new model for identifying promising young people from less advantaged urban environments. Working with public high schools and other community organizations, Deborah Beal evaluates potential candidates using a rigorous assessment process based on qualities such as leadership, teamwork, communication skills, and motivations. Qualities that are as critical to successful navigation of undergraduate education as academic track records. The most promising students are invited to join a posse, a small group that participates that participates in an eight-month pre-collegiate training program that builds individual and team skills and serves, an essential, serves as an essential social support system on campus. Deborah Beal received a Bachelor of Arts from Brandeis University and a Master in Education from Harvard University's Graduate School of Education. She has served as the founder and president of the Posse Foundation since 1989. Deborah Beal is also a founding partner of the consulting company Firefly Education. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Beal to the <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And a special thank you to all the Posse Scholars who are sitting in the first couple of rows here. It's exciting to be here with you supporting me. It's like having a Posse. I'm excited. <laughs> But um, Stephanie, thanks for inviting me, and Scott Cowan, who you, you have a great president at this institution, a really great president who I think sees social entrepreneurship as something vital for the students who go here. And that without instilling in the students at Tulane a sense of civic engagement and you know, this idea that we need to make the world a better place, we wouldn't be doing our job as an institution, and I commend him for that. And it's fun to be part of the speaker series. Hopefully I can add a teeny little bit to that, that mission. Um, I don't usually bring note cards, but I brought them because I'm trying a different way of doing a presentation. So it's going to be note cards and PowerPoint and video, and then Q&A. I could do it. And I have two microphones. <laughs> I'm loaded down, so. <laughs> what I thought might be interesting, you know, we're, we're living in a world that has no shortage of challenges and issues. And you think about, you know, do we have, do we have room to be optimistic? I don't know how many of you, and, and you don't have to answer this question, but think in your own minds. Do you describe yourself as happy? in your life? Are you happy? And then do you think that you're living in a world that's good enough? And then ask yourself, well, what am I doing to make it better? We've got challenges that are so mind-boggling and that are so part of our current day. Since 9-11, terrorism, for example, is no longer an alien idea 
It's right here. We worry about it here. I live in New York City. I ride the subway. And frankly, it's in the back of my mind. If the subway gets stuck now, I sometimes begin to wonder, you know, is it safe? I never wondered that before 9-11. I never did. We have a problem with guns. I, you know, my husband writes a column for the New York Times, and he gave me this stat. So I'm taking it from him. But since the 1960s, when Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy were assassinated, more than one million people in the United States have died because of guns. That's a lot of people. A million people in 50 years, basically. We got some issues. There are other issues, right? Do you care about your civil liberties? Would you give up your privacy if you felt we were going to be in a safer country? Is it OK that metal detectors are now in high schools? Some kids have to go through metal detectors every single day before they can get to homeroom. Is that OK? There's identity theft, right? So all this stuff is going on. We're losing our newspapers. Is that OK? You know, technology is taking over. So there's a lot that should concern us deeply, a lot that we could be doing. We could just pick a cause. Because there's, I, we were talking to a bunch of, of you guys before at dinner, and policy scholars were saying, well, there isn't maybe one main cause anymore. There are so many causes that you don't really hear about a single movement in the United States like you did with the women's movement or civil rights. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's being defined by the new generation, which we call the millennials. I didn't even know that term until recently. How many of you know you're a millennial? So this particular generation, born in the early 80s, for you know, the 20 years after that, you're defined by the outsiders um, through the technology you use. And some think that you are a less social generation because you only use technology to communicate. Others think you're a hypersocial generation because you're so connected. But what's great about your generation is you get to decide whether you're going to challenge the status quo or not. So social entrepreneurship is all about that. It's about picking something that you can address, have an impact on, make a difference, hopefully for the better, in the world. Um, I thought I would tell <laughs> you're going to laugh, I hope. You might, we might not laugh. <laughs> but I, I thought I would tell you a story that would illustrate this idea. I'm uh, personally afraid of flying. Like, I'm really afraid I have to take a pill when I get on an airplane. And I read a book called How We Make Decisions by Jonah Lehrer. Has anybody heard of that book? He's a Rhodes Scholar. He's already written three books. He lives in California. He's great. He kind of writes um, in a similar way to, to, have you read Outliers? Mm -hmm. OK, you're getting the idea. So he tells this story about airplane crashes. And up until the 1980s, from like 1940 on, there were real problems with how airplanes were crashing. And there were too many airplane crashes. And it was an enormous issue because a lot of the, planes were, were, the plane crashes were caused by pilot error. So people didn't want to fly on airplanes. They were worried. And the airplane industry said, we need to do something about this. We have a need. We need to stop the planes from crashing for this reason. So they came up with two solutions that are going to seem really obvious to you. You're going to think that's, this is, we, we didn't think of this before. One of those solutions was computer simulated airplane flights that pilots could learn on a computer and actually make mistakes on the ground through their training. They didn't have that before. Invaluable. The other solution was something called CRM, Cock Pit Resource Management. Have you heard of that? OK, some of you have heard of that. That happens in the cockpit where the pilot is. It used to be 
that pilots had a godlike quality. And everybody who was on the plane with that pilot would defer to the pilot. They might make a kind of suggestion and be quiet about it, but they wouldn't dare contradict the pilot's ideas or decision making. Well, we realized that was a big mistake because pilots were making mistakes without checking with the team. So they radically changed that and said, no longer can the pilot make a decision alone. It has to be a team effort. And they changed the decision making process to include something called C R M. Thank you. And guess what? Plane crashes were redu reduced so dramatically that since that time, we have only had one plane crash because of pilot error. Dramatic. In fact, and I'll tell you the data. Oh, I think I didn't write down the data. <laughs> I didn't write it down. But I want to tell you, hold on. Anyway, so, so it's 71% fewer crashes because of, of pilot error. So we think, OK, these two solutions seem so obvious, but the need was there. So what does that have to do with Posse? Right? You came to hear a little bit about Posse and what Posse is doing in the world. We saw, also in the 1980s, a tremendous need. Institutions of higher education, especially the elite institutions in the United States, were having tremendous difficulty recruiting students from really diverse backgrounds. And if they were recruiting those students, they weren't keeping them. Right? This was happening all over. So great, great schools were ending up with white student bodies, graduating white student bodies, and that ended up meaning we, we were giving the workforce basically a population of white people who could go take on leadership positions. It was a problem. So Posse designed something that used the cohort model, right? So what happened was, you'll hear me say this probably three times tonight on the video and everywhere, there was one kid who was, who was a great, smart kid who went to Brown University. And six months later, he had dropped out. This was a kid from the Bronx. And, and he was a black kid. And we thought, we knew this kid. I worked with this kid. And he was super smart. And there was no reason he couldn't do well. But he said, well, I dropped out, but if I had my posse with me, I wouldn't have dropped out. Now, back in the 1980s, posse was a little bit more of a hip word than it is today. <laughs> but it meant my group of friends, the people who backed me up. And we thought, well, there is a simple solution. Why not send a team of students together to college so they could back each other up? And that way, if you grew up in a big urban center, but you ended up in Middlebury, Vermont, or Greencastle, Indiana, or New Orleans or something, you'd be a little less likely to turn around and go home. You'd have a bunch of people that you could kind of turn to to get you over the hump. So we started Posse. And I'm going to tell you more about Posse in a minute. But there was another issue that compounded the problem. And I'm going to go back to this book, How We Make Decisions, and give you another example. How many of you know about the Wonderlick test? Good. Only you? Only you guys? Nobody else? You know. OK. So correct me if I get it a little wrong. I think I have it right. The Wonderlick test is used by the NFL. It's basically a shortened version of the IQ test, right? And the NFL uses it to identify players that they think are particularly smart. And they especially care about the score when they're looking for quarterbacks. Why do you think that is? Why? Leaders. Well, they're actually looking for, I'll tell you what they think they're looking for. They're looking for people that they think are good at solving math and logic problems. Why would a quarterback need to be good at math and logic? Huh? Critical thinking, because what do they have to do? What do quarterbacks have to do? Yeah, they have to throw the ball. <laughs> but yeah, they have to make quick decisions. Actually, this is where the problem lies. They have to, well, they have to be able to think in the pocket or outside the pocket, right, really fast. 
They have to be logical. They have to know what to do. They have to remember a million different plays. So they thought we need guys who have really good Wunderlich scores. And a good Wunderlich score is 25 and up. There's like 50 questions on the test. They thought they'd make better decisions. So they noticed that Vince Young, now I have to look at my card, he got a six. I know. Right? Then there was this guy, Dan Marino, he got a 14. He got a 14. And Randall Cunningham, Terry Bradshaw, they got 15. These are guys, these are like Hall of Fame guys, right? But they weren't get, they, nowhere near 25 and up. On, on. Then the, have you heard of these guys, Alex Smith and Matt Leinhardt? Yeah. Kind of, yeah, they're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got 35s on their Wonderlic score. So, so suddenly the NFL was realizing maybe this is not the best predictor or the only predictor to find great quarterbacks. Right? Well, what is, again, what does this have to do with posse? Posse, too, said just like that. Can you guess what I'm about to say? Huh? Standardized testings were compounded. Right? We knew, we know tests like the SAT find some great kids, right? But do they find every great kid? No. Where, Tom Brady. Where was Tom Brady drafted? Sixth round. He was a sixth round draft pick. And is he good? He's pretty good. <laughs> He's pretty good. Well, so Posse was saying, oh, another solution to the problem. Let's do this cohort model thing. That's one solution. And let's try and create a different way of identifying talent. Because obviously, the current way we're identifying talent isn't always finding all the great kids. OK, so I want you to keep both of those. I didn't use my cards. I want you to keep both of those things in mind as we turn our attention to the PowerPoint. Because <laughs> what I want to do is take a step back and look at where we are today. In what context does a program like Posse exist? How do I turn it on? Thank you. OK, so here we go. Higher ed in the United States. This is the current <coughs> demographics of the United States. You're probably familiar with that, right? 65% white. This is what we project the population will look like by 2050. So whites will no longer be, non-Hispanic whites will no longer be the majority. And in fact, you guys from LA? Who's the majority in Los Angeles? Already. In fact, the Latino population is the fastest growing population in the United States. But when you look at who's getting bachelor's degrees today, 72% of them are white. This shows you from 1972 what the college going rates are in the United States. Now, this particular chart has his, um, Hispanic or Latino on the bottom. Then black is red and white is blue. So you can see, and I'm going to stop here for a second, that blacks and Latinos have the lowest college going rates. There is one interesting point on this chart. Where is it? Yes. Why is that interesting? Well, what happens right there? I can't reach it, but you can see. What happens? Yes. What? Everyone started now. At the same rate. Yeah. It's the only time in this, during this period that blacks, Latinos, and whites were going to college at the same rate. Why? You know, you know what happened. What, why? Why was that happening? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what that was? <laughs> GI Bill. What else? The Pell Grant. What else had happened that was really big in this country? What happened right before this period of time? Yeah, the civil rights movement. You had affirmative action had kicked in. So the Pell Grant, the, the GI Bill, and look what happened. It was possible. And then things started to deteriorate, right? A lot of reasons. A lot of things started happening, and we never achieved that again. 
This shows you the um, graduation rates. And finally, this country started collecting data on Asian students. So you see the top line are the Asian students. But as you can see, blacks and Latinos are still, and it's pretty level, graduating at lower rates than whites and Asians. I think it's important just to take a second. You probably can't read this. We tend to lump groups together by race. It's unfair. It helps us when we try to analyze the situation. But this shows you the breakdown of educational attainment for Asians. And if you just look at Chinese and Thai and Cambodian and Vietnamese and Japanese and Filipino, there's all different things going on. So be careful about lumping. I'm just lumping to make a point. You're OK with that? In addition, of course, and this is part of why that, um, that chart before uh, um, was deteriorating, college became more and more and more expensive. I don't have to tell you guys that. So this shows you the net college cost as a percentage of, of um, median family income. And you can see that for the people in the lowest quartile, socioeconomic quartile, it's ridiculously expensive and become more and more and more expensive while it has changed very little for people from the highest brackets. So who's graduating? I think this is astounding. So 75% of people from high SES families, socioeconomic status it stands for, are graduating compared to 9% from low SES backgrounds. I don't know if this is true, Scott, at Tulane, but for many institutions, for most institutions, the best colleges in the United States, 75% of the student body come from the top 25% of um, the economic quartile. I mean, you get it, the <laughs> economic background in this country. And now we're going to talk, I'm going to show you my favorite chart. We're going to talk about standardized tests. Posse, and you'll have to, you can question, make, uh, ask questions about this later. We focus on the top, the most elite colleges and universities in the United States. So we thought it would be very interesting to take the top 150 schools. How many of you know how many four-year institutions are in the country? Like 1,400, a little more than that. So if you take the top 150 of those schools, we said, OK, well, how many black kids would those schools need if they wanted to represent the population of the United States, have the same percentage of blacks on their campuses as exist in the population? And we found that those schools would need 48,000 students per year. So we said, OK, let's be conservative. And let's see, because schools tend still to rely heavily on test scores, how many black kids in the United States scored, let's say, 1,200 we used to be conservative or above on just the math and verbal? And we found that 6,800 score that. Are you, get, are you following my, my lead? There is a problem. If you need 48,000 students a year, but only 6,800 are scoring 1,200 or above, don't you need another way of finding amazing kids? You can't only use the SAT. We, we said, OK, same thing for the Latino population. You need 61,000, but only 15,000 are scoring 1,200 or above. And you can see Asians are overrepresented. So the result is, this is what we're ending up with. This is the unemployment rates by race as, as of December. Shows you that whites still dominate as managers and professionals. We thought you might be interested in looking at your state legislators by race. And how about the US senators? by race. It's 2011. And by the way, 17% are women. Out of the Fortune 500 companies, 
You might know these stats. Five are black, the CEOs. Seven are Latino. Seven are Asian. Fifteen are women out of 500. And some of those overlap. We did this on our own. We said, everyone talks about the CEOs, but maybe, maybe we should look at the executives, you know, the top 10 or 15 people in each company. And we picked 80 of these companies. We actually were picking the ones from the Posse cities. And this is what we found. 91% are white. Why are you all whispering? <laughs> so Posse. This is what Posse says it's going to do. And, and really, it's so important when you think about social change or social entrepreneurship or what you're, Posse, if you're thinking of it as a college access program, just get that out of your mind. Because this year we had 12,000 nominations for 500 slots. It is an unbelievably prestigious and elite program for young people who are incredible leaders and who will represent what we believe will be the leadership of the future. So the goal of Posse is not access. I mean, that's good. That's part of it. But in partnership with Tulane and a bunch of other colleges, we're saying our goal is to create a new kind of leadership network in the United States. Think back to the senators, the CEOs, right? Think back. We want the leadership of the United States to better represent the demographics of the country. We want the people who sit at the tables where decisions get made to be from big urban centers, to be black and Latino, to be Dominican, to be Puerto Rican, to be Jewish and Pakistani, to be gay and straight. We want them to be as diverse as this country is diverse. That's what we want. That's the goal. So, we're going to expand the pool that Tulane can find kids and our 38 other partner schools. We're going to help you guys do what you're already doing, which is make a more integrated community. And we're going to make sure that our Posse scholars are graduating so they can go be those leaders in the workforce. And I can explain these more later, but we have the most comprehensive program in the entire country, starting in high school, and going all the way through college and into the workforce. Once you're in Posse, you can get, never get rid of us, ever. <laughs> so there's a screening process. There's an eight-month pre-collegiate program. There's a four-year campus program. There's a career program. And then we expand our, our um, outreach through a program called Posse Access. This is why I think it works. There are two mentors in here. Can you guys raise your hand? Okay, they're sitting together. <laughs> and maybe later you can say something about it. I, I think maybe the number one most critical component of the program is the mentoring component. Um, and it's not just a support piece for Posse scholars. It's also a way of building ownership in, at, at a university community. So what do you do in your everyday life? when you're not a mentor? What? I teach in the business school. What do you do? I'm a professor of American literature. Okay, those, how, how, how do we pick them? Imagine that, professor of American <laughs> literature and comic, right? <laughs> teach in the business school. Imagine you have a physics professor, the French literature professor, the African studies professor, every year a different mentor, and you suddenly begin to build a community of faculty and administrators on this campus who own this diversity initiative with Scott. So it's not just your dean of multicultural affairs who owns it. It's radical. And so their job is not just a wonderful job of supporting scholars. It's also bringing this idea of community into the university. The final thing is that we're strength-based. I don't know how many of you have worked with youth organizations in the United States or in schools, but so many of us make the mistake of defining our programs by the deficiencies of the population with which we work. Oh, we're an at-risk program. Oh, we're a poor kids program. Oh, we're a minority program. And not that those things aren't important, but there was a man in California who walked up to me the other day and he said, oh, you're just like this program I know of in New York. You should go talk to them. They're called Overcoming Obstacles. And I was thinking, wow, imagine you're in that program. 
No, really. And you say, hi, I'm Debbie Beal. I'm in Overcoming Obstacles. <laughs> you know, so the, I think this idea that we have to find strengths and build programs around strengths is really important, and that's what Posse is doing. So here are all the cities that we operate in, in order of appearance. <laughs> Miami was our last city. And we want to double our national footprint within the next 10 years. But in 20 years, we've sent 3,600 students to college. And from schools like Tulane, they have won an astounding $400 million in leadership scholarships. Amazing. They're graduating at 90%. They're leaders on campus and becoming leaders in the workforce. In fact, a student who's only, an alum who's 38 years old is now the dean of the college at Middlebury. She was in the first posse. She had 800 combined on her SATs. She doesn't mind my telling you. <laughs> we have a bunch of partners. These are our colleges and university partners. We need to double that. These are our graduate school partners. We need to double that. You can't read that, but we have career partners like Disney and MTV Networks and Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. This is what our students look like. Pretty diverse. This is the gender breakdown. But we do have two women's colleges that are partners, Mount Holyoke and Bryn Mawr. This is what our nominations look like over the past six years. So if you tell me there's no kids out there, I will disagree. And this is what they're doing. The next chart will mean nothing. It's kind of funny. But oh, no, this one's good. They're going to grad school, 45% of them. This chart, you can't really tell. But they're majoring in a million different things and going to different fields. And then finally, after 20 years of a program that we think works pretty well, we're getting a lot of attention. And uh, for us, super exciting was that Barack Obama shared some of his Nobel Peace Prize money with us this past year as one of 10 organizations to, to receive that honor. So we're going to show you a short video. It's eight minutes. It'll bring the program to life. And in the back of your mind, if you can think, OK, it's not just an access program. It's a social change program, creating leaders who will represent the voices of all Americans. Generally, in the big inner city public schools, the artist, the scientist, the historian, the linguist, those children all get lost in the crowd. When we evaluate on the basis of their test scores, we've missed a tremendous amount of that person. We have a non-meritorious method of defining merit in this country. Um, we have tests that relate very, very strongly to family income and parent education levels. We recognize in the College Board that there's other predictors that are very, very important, and sometimes even more important than a test score. Just as SAT scores over a long period of time have been a great predictor of success, Posse likewise can show you their students and show you their success in exactly the same way. The American dream doesn't mean anything if people can be screened out of opportunities in life. You can make it if you try. I was raised in South Central, seven children, and I'm the first to graduate high school and the first to go to college, let alone go to grad school. You got to move if you want to be a head. This is where I went to high school. Crips and Bloods patrolling the hallways more than the deans would. I never thought that I would go to university. Never. I didn't have the resources. Posse has developed a strategy for identifying unbelievably talented young people who can succeed in college. 
It's called the dynamic assessment process. It puts young people into a dynamic setting. We're looking for communication skills and leadership and initiative and ability to work well in a team. And what we're finding are young people who are gonna take a campus by storm. We all started screaming. <laughs> everyone was hugging everyone. And here's this bunch of kids all surrounding her and all crying. And it was really, really a, a once in a lifetime moment. Knowing that 1,300 students wanted this scholarship and I'm one of the 10, my mom cried like so much, like if someone had died or something. We've been through it all, economic, emotional, everything, and still managed to go to college. So it means the world to us. They get early admittance in January, and then it's our job to get them ready, which is eight months worth of work as a group, building a team approach, we're going to graduate these kids like we have over the last two decades at over 90 percent. When I first came here, I was really intimidated. I feared that I wouldn't fit in, that my views would not be affirmed. I thought of dropping out. And then I'd hang out with my posse, and they're like, dude, you're all right. You'll be fine. You know, we'll all be fine because we're a posse. We're here together. Posse started because of one student who said he never would have dropped out of college if he had his posse with him. Now why not send a team of students or a posse to college together so they could back each other up? The posse idea can be transformational and it's really helped our campus. Posse scholars are bold, they're creative, innovative, they're outgoing. When you bring students together from a wide range of backgrounds and experiences, the conversations in the classroom are much more powerful. Everyone learns more. In order for us to minimize all this hatred in the world, we need to be having these conversations. If we don't, we're stagnant and we're not growing as a nation. Alex is a good example of someone who has done very well academically, been very active in student activities. He's uh, someone whom students look up to. We're really fortunate that he's come here they bring students with leadership qualities and they help to develop those leadership qualities. I'm a social psychologist and I, I find that interesting, the stress on leadership. If you're a leader, you're somebody who can't really whine. <laughs> you're supposed to find a way to overcome. I came to Wheaton and Wheaton said, well, there wasn't just Manhattan, there's the world. You can go to South Africa, you can go to Tanzania, you can do lots of different things. There is absolutely no way you can be an effective leader in the 21st century and not be prepared to deal with diversity. We've been such a successful society because of our diversity, right from the beginning, from the nature of government to our literature. You take a problem like the achievement gap, okay. posse scholars, as they get in a position to be the researchers and the teachers and the school administrators, they have some of the insights that we need to solve that problem. We love our college and university partners. This is a commitment. They are, by definition, the thought leaders in higher education. Graduating from Carleton College, you have this brotherhood and sisterhood with so many people. Posse goes way beyond opening doors of access in higher education. Um, it really is a movement. There aren't a lot of things in higher education about which you can say the results, the aim, the mission are unambiguous and it works. I think the Posse program is the greatest single idea in higher education in the last quarter of a century. The thing about having a Posse is that you're able to grow times 10. You're picking up strengths from other Posse members, helping them with their weaknesses, which help you recognize your own. Posse trains us how to be successful at transforming ourselves, our families, the institutions that we are a part of, and ultimately the world. We're training these young people for the very qualities and skills that companies and corporations are looking for for a leadership track position. And in an organization like ours, where we have all different types of clients' experiences, teams that are different, teams that come to the table with diversity, get better answers and Posse helps us find those people. 
I think posse is especially important because if we do things right, you can't even begin to imagine what this country is capable of achieving. Tonight, we want to show you a unique program. In the Posse movement. I've really enjoyed watching the Posse Foundation grow. We're creating a new kind of leadership network, one that this country has never seen. This network of Posse alums can, in fact, spearhead decisions that need to be made in this country. I think that Posse is creating that network out there. Barriers you've seen all your life start to fall. That's what I live for, that's exciting. The battle that Posse is fighting is a battle that needs to be won if this country is going to reclaim its place at the forefront. We need a Posse in every city in this country. I go to these award ceremonies and I see the scholars who return. I have such faith in the future because they are going to be there leading the way.